Getting to the end of Magad. Good. Page 36. 37 in the English, 36 in, English, in the Hebrew. Yeah. Okay, so last week we started to learn about the Passover essentials as they were articulated <laughs> by Rabban Gamliel. And this is going to be part two. And I want to begin part two with a, a kind of a, an overview commentary that comes from one of the early talks of the Rebbe. This is in the early 50s. And the Rebbe suggested that at this point in the Haggadah, after we finished recounting the whole story, and we also acknowledged all of Hashem's kindness, and we said thank you, we did all that, which both is the meaning of Haggadah. Haggadah means telling. Haggadah means also to acknowledge Hashem's kindness and thank. At this point, the Haggadah kind of boils it back down to a basic essence. Sometimes because of the depth and because of the elaborate nature of whatever it is that we're presenting, that we sometimes we lose sight of the basic points. So it's, it's a good idea to bring things back to some basics, back to basics. It doesn't mean the elaboration and the details weren't important and necessary. It just means in order for us to appreciate it, you've got to bring it back to its closing. There's a concept in Hasidus called Chacham Bebina. Chachma is a conjunction of two Hebrew words, Koachma. I'm not talking about chachma as it's understood in the, in the literal sense or as people use it euphemistically as wise or wisdom. Chachma, as Hasidus explains it to me, chachma is the inner essence of the word. Chachma means intellectual creativity, which could be coming up with a new idea, a new solution, a new invention, or, ah, that's what you mean. Now I got it. You, you heard it three times until you had the aha moment, and you got it. So you didn't come up with anything new, but it was a creative moment for you. It was a moment you were able to grasp the concept that was being conveyed. And the notion of chachma, whether it be a good idea or a creative approach or simply getting it, comes, if you will, out of nowhere. It comes out of the dark. It doesn't slowly build. There's an aha moment, what's called in the language of academia, an epiphany. A light bulb moment. That's chachma. And that's koyachma. It's a power that comes out of nowhere. And what follows is something called bina. And bina is typically explained or translated as understanding, but in a much deeper way, bina means to analyze and to develop. It shares a common root with the word bone, to build. So you have to build the idea. You had an aha moment, but aha moments can be like driving at a dark road and suddenly... You have a lightning, a flash of lightning, and the whole road is open and clear before you for just a moment. And then you're in the dark again. And now you have to recreate the clarity that you had in that moment so you're able to navigate your way. So people have aha moments, but you have to do something with the aha. You have to develop the idea. It's been said that there's nothing as valuable as a good idea. And there's also nothing as worthless. Because ideas, they come, and they go. And, they, and the people who have a, a thousand ideas a day, nothing ever happens with it. But if somebody actually has a good idea that they develop, th this can be extraordinary. I remember once reading somewhere that the founder of DHL was in Wharton School of Business, and he had this idea, idea for a company. It was, it was called DHL. The, the forerunner, this guy eventually went on to found DHL, which is a multi-million dollar company, hundreds of millions of dollars. He got a failing grade. The professor did not think it was a good idea. But he wasn't daunted. He said, I still think it's a good idea. That, that was his business plan. And who's laughing last? But it's only a good idea if you develop the idea. He possessed the, uh, not only the insight and the creativity, but also the acumen and, I think, the courage to forge ahead. That takes stamina to make an idea come off the drawing board becoming a reality. So that's Bina. But oftentimes, when people analyze and analyze and then analyze some more, they get stuck in the analysis. It becomes like a labyrinth of, of, of development, of, of going in all directions. So sometimes what's needed after intense analysis is 
Let's bring it back to its essence. That's what's called in Hasidus, Chacham Bebina. It's the Chachma that follows Bina. The Rebbe doesn't use this terminology, but that's my understanding of, of what he says. He says, because of the Arichas and Yonim, because things are so lengthy and developed on the night of Pesach, or through pages after pages, so it's very easy to lose the Nekuda. The Nekuda is the point. You, sometimes you lose the point because the point is so well developed and explained. You don't know what the point is anymore. And therefore, the Rebbe says, as we are coming to the close of Magid, and this is the close of Magid, we're going to do a final act of telling, and that's the three essentials, and then we go into a final act of thanksgiving. That's the blessing that concludes Magid. So as we conclude in Magid, we have to say, okay, let's boil this back to its essence. So what's the essence of Magid? And this follows very, very um, specifically according to the way we understood Rabbi Gamliel and his essentials in last in our previous class, that this is not speaking about fulfilling the mitzvah of matzah or marah or pesach. There is such a school of thought. You have to articulate and explain why you're doing this. But rather, this is about the story of magid. This is the template. Here's what your magid should look like. Here's the way you tell the story. These are the essential points that have to be brought forth. So the Rebbe says, what is the essence of magid? The essence of magid, according to Rebbe Gamliel, was Pesach, Matzah, and Morah. Pesach alludes to the Korban Pesach, the meat that was eaten at the Seder after everybody was satiated, the special Korban that was brought in the Beis HaMikdash on Erev Pesach. Matzah, of course, is the unleavened wafers that we eat on the night of the Seder. And finally, Morah is the bitter herbs which are eaten first on their own and then later in a customary fashion together with Matzah. And the Rebbe notes that there's a big difference between these three mitzvahs, or these three details. And to quote from the Alter Rebbe in chapter 475 of Hilchas Pesach, which is, I'm quoting it from the Alter, Shuch- Alter Rebbe Shochanoruch because he pulls together from the Shochanoruch and his commentaries, and he provides us with a succinct tapestry of the actual halacha. He says, and this is in the subsection 15, I want to read it to you. Mitzvahs moror min ha-Torah, the mitzvah of bitter herbs. Biblically speaking, eno elo bizman shah pesach nechal. It only applies at such time when the korban pesach, the paschal offering, is being consumed. Which obviously means in the time of the Beit HaMikdash. How do we know that? Shenemar. Because the scripture states it very clearly in the ninth chapter of Numbers, in the 11th verse, it says, quote, Al matzais umerorim yoichluhu. You should eat the Korban Pesach. How should you eat the Korban Pesach? Not alone. With ketchup and mustard. I mean, it doesn't say ketchup and mustard. It says the condiments are, you eat it with moror and with matzah. You don't just eat a carbon Pesach. You don't just eat a piece of meat. You eat it with myrrh and matzah. Th- those are the necessary accompaniment for the carbon Pesach. Nowhere in the Torah does it say, V'achalta moror. It doesn't say you should eat moror. It says you should eat carbon Pesach. When you eat a carbon Pesach, when you consume the Paschal offering at the Seder, eat it with moror and matzah. So obviously, if there's no mitzvah in the Torah to eat moror, it's only that murder was something we were instructed to eat along with Karben Pesach. We understand that Bizman Hazeh, in today's day and age, unfortunately, we don't have a Beit HaMikdash yet, Eino Ela Medivri Sofer. So why do we eat murder? Why do we eat bitter herbs? And don't tell me because it tastes good. The rabbis ordained we do it. It's a rabbinic mitzvah. Why did the rabbis make this mitzvah? Because there was such a mitzvah in the time of the Beit HaMikdash. Okay. So that's in the time of the Beis HaMikdash. Why would the rabbis make us do something which we anyway can't do as the Torah told us to do it? And the answer is Shetiknu. This was ordained by our sages, Zecher Lemikdash, as a memory of the Beit HaMikdash. So we did it to remember the Beis HaMikdash. I'm going to give you a silly example, but you can all relate to this, I'm sure. Maybe you lost a grandparent, a parent, who had a favorite dessert. Something they liked to do, a shtick they had, whether at a yomtev table or a Shabbat table or a favorite dessert. And then it's Bubi's yard site 
And we say, today we're serving Booby's ice cream because Booby loved the ice cream. You ever hear people say something like that? They said, but yeah, but the whole point wasn't the ice cream. The booby would make the ice cream and she would bring the ice cream. And that was the whole point. She was the life of the party. She came to the Seder. She baked the Pesach brownies. It wasn't about Bubby's brownies. It was about Bubby. And Bubby came along with Bubby's brownies. Okay, we don't have Bubby anymore. So what should we do? Okay, so, so we're spending time with Bubby. Well, not really, but we're thinking of her. I was once at a funeral. It's a silly funeral, actually, in my opinion. But, but there was, I was looking for me. I look for meaning. I look for, like, depth. Give me something. Like, some of those things people say, just like, hello. <laughs> okay, so but I'm looking. I'm, I'm, okay, fine. Maybe there's something more than what they're saying. So they, 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 they said something interesting. The people said that uh, this, this mother slash grandmother used to make a certain kind of food. And they used to come, when they would come visit, this was her favorite thing she served. That was like, you came, you get, whatever it may be. I'm not going to say what it is in case you're at the funeral. It was a thing. <laughs> so the night before the funeral, the family sat down to plan the funeral, <laughs> which unfortunately was held two days after, and it shouldn't have been that way, but whatever. People do what they do. I can only cajole, encourage. can't force anybody to do anything. So they sat down to plan what will be said and who, who will say it and how it will be said. And... Somebody found in the fridge, or in the freezer, pardon me, somebody found the last batch that was made. So, so they sat down around the table discussing Bubby's funeral, eating Bubby's food. <laughs> so I said, you know what, that's actually meaningful. Okay, it's not, it's, it only sounds silly, but it's, it's actually, there's a profundity to it. The profundity is, I, I wanted to look at it is, that we leave something for, for our children. Of course, it shouldn't just be cake or cookies or candy. It should be a legacy. And then when we live by that legacy, so our spirit actually lives on. Our, our spirit shouldn't just live on through cookies and brownies, through cake and chocolate. Our spirit should live on through real nourishment, spiritual nourishment. But that made sense to them. And it was okay. You know, like, that made sense to them. It worked for them. It made them feel better. They felt she was participating in the planning of her own funeral. Okay. And then I thought, wow, that's, that's what Zecher Migdash means. So we lost the base on Migdash. We don't have a base on Migdash. But we're doing things which make us remember the Beis HaMikdash. Because, you know, in the time of the Beis HaMikdash, we would have Moror, and now we don't have Moror. So we should have Moror. Why should we have Moror? We should have Moror because it reminds us of the Beis HaMikdash. That's the Zecher. And these kind of memories are extremely meaningful. They touch us. They touch us. It could be something as simple as cookies. It could be something as simple as cake. Something as simple as tea. It touches us. Why? Because it brings to mind. Really and truly, it's much more than just the bitter herbs. You know what it's really about? It's really about Bubby. It's really about the Beis HaMikdash. We're really, we're really remembering the Beis HaMikdash. And in this way, the Beis HaMikdash's memory is alive. And that, that's how you could have grandchildren who never met a grandparent or a great-grandparent. And they say, I feel like I know my grandparent. Why? Stories, pictures, songs pieces of their life that are left behind, especially when it's Yom Tov related. Anyway, this is just my little commentary on the idea of Zecher Migdash. That's a Zecher Migdash. It's a memory of the Beis Migdash, And this kept the Beis Migdash alive for us. A- another very famous example of this, incidentally, is taking a little of an esrig on seven days of the Yom Tov of, Pe- of, of Ha'asukas. In the Beis Migdash, it was taken for seven days. Outside the Beis Migdash, it was only taken on the first day. How do we know that? Because it says, You take on the first day. So why do we take it for seven days? Rabbi Yechonim Zakai said, We should remember, we used to have a Beis HaMikdash. We used to have a mother. We used to have a father, a grandmother. We used to have a Beis HaMikdash. And we believe we'll have a Beis HaMikdash again in Merz Hashem. But until then, it's of rabbinic ordination. So that's the story with Murr. So why do we eat Murr today? Who told us to eat Murr? Who told us to eat mar? We say, Asher Kedishanu. You know that. Asher Kedishanu, the mitzvot avetz yivanu. We say, God commanded us. He didn't command us. Show me the pasuk. Show me the verse. He didn't. The ah, the sages. He commanded us to listen to the sages. So when we listen to the sages, who are we really listening to? Ultimately to God. Because God commanded us to listen to the sages. But it's not min Torah, It's medivri sofer. It's not biblical. It's only rabbinic. We can make a bracha, like we make a bracha on the Hanukkah menorah, like we make a bracha on the reading of the Megillah. 
but it doesn't say it in the Torah. However, eating matzah on the first night, I can't emphasize this enough, night, 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 underline that, after it's dark, even in today's day and age where we have no Beit HaMikdash and no Korban Pesach and no more biblically, but we still have a mitzvah to eat matzah. How do we know that? Because it says, Be'erev tochlu matzos. The Torah says openly, at night, you have to eat the matzah. Ah, so the Torah says you have to eat matzah. V'lehuzkashon Pesach, there's no mention of Korban Pesach there. That just says matzah. So from this we understand that the mitzvah of matzah is not a detail in Korban Pesach, but rather matzah is matzah, a mitzvah in itself. Okay, so having said this, the Rebbe says, so we have three, if you will, central points or essentials of the Pesach holiday. We have the matzah, which we eat today by ordination, by dint of the Torah itself. We have the moro, which we eat today, which we eat today because the rabbis told us we should do this. It's a rabbinic mitzvah. And then we have the carbon Pesach. Now the carbon Pesach, who eats it? Who eats the shank palm? Nobody. In fact, you're not allowed to eat it. It's on display. Yeah, it's on display. And why is it on display? To remember. To remember. It's a zechel of migdash. In the fullest sense, it's not something we can actually do anything for. It's, it's so that the Rebbe says, it's a zecher. For the time of the Beis HaMikdash, the Rebbe says something very interesting here. So, I mean, this is edited Sikha, so every word is so carefully measured. The Rebbe says it's a hachona to the Geulah Hasida. It's a preparation for the future. And what he might mean here is that if we didn't have the shank bone on our Seder, but you do want to call the radio for me, because I'm going to get interrupted now. 416-870-1540. You're going to have to edit this out later on also. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it probably was. It's, it, it, they change the time with me. Just hold on to it. As soon as I go live, just hand it to me. I'm sorry to everybody who's watching live. We get interrupted now. The time changed. It is what it is. This is... We're good? I'm, I'm afraid to start in the middle. Then you have to edit out and... <laughs> I apologize if I jug the memory. But isn't it, isn't, uh, how do you do that? How do you? The, who's going to, there you go, there you go. <laughs> and somebody does it, right? Okay, so <laughs> knocking over the wine, <laughs> knocking over the wine actually messed up the tablecloth. So you talk about it, right? But, but what if it wasn't a mess? What if you would put the wine, I don't know, on, on, on top of a mirror or something? Yeah. Somebody would do it. Yeah, they, would. they would, right? And in this way, you would feel your father still sitting with you at the Seder, right? Exactly. I see you moved to tears. Yeah. This is the point. And we did it when my mother's birthday came along a couple months ago. We, we said we always used to bring her in the home a big birthday cake. The children used to come. We did it. That you did it? I, I love it. Anyway. See, it's exactly what I was saying. Yeah. That's, well, that's I can make you laugh. You won't cry. Brian's family had their Kriva animals, and they had a little doxy, and she, she was named after Moshe Dayan. Her name was Diane. And when they would sing Diane at the table, the dog would come. <laughs> Every time the little dog would hear Diane, the dog would just go crazy at the table. That's actually pretty funny. So this is, I mean, what, what I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to say about Zechel and Migdash, it's a very real thing. It's not a theory. It's very real. This idea of Zechel and Migdash is very real, and we can understand that in our own lives. We actually, we do things like this. Our sages weren't talking about some esoteric thing like, you know, Zechel and Migdash. It's real. It's a real thing. It's human nature. Good morning, Zelda. I'm fine. Baruch Hashem. How are you today? Well, you know, you know, it's such an interesting question that you raise, Zelda. 
when you talk about, about Moshe and Aaron. I mean, you, you, you essentially, when you ask me to talk about the biblical figures, I'm sure many of our listeners are thinking in their minds of uh, the, the movies they saw <laughs> and how those people were depicted, which is probably very far from reality. And our sages actually forbade drawing imaginary pictures of Moses and Aaron it's just inappropriate. It's, you, you conjecture images, uh, children see pictures like this, and they think they actually know who Moses and Aaron were. We should focus on Moses and Aaron. In fact, the Mishnah tells us we should be disciples of Aaron, even though he hasn't walked the face of earth in a terrestrial way for more than three millennia. The, the point is that we should learn from their lives, and we should learn from their teachings, and we should learn from the way they behaved. And when we do that, then their spirit continues to live on within each and every one of us. And, and they become larger than life, for in truth, they really are. And then there's this idea, Zelda, that the biblical figures all represent something which is a proverbial, a metaphoric, that reaches and transcends their individual lifetimes or their corporeal existence. For example, you talked about Moshe and Aaron. I mean, M Moshe and Aaron conversely represent the concepts of Torah study and prayer. The last of the prophets, Malachi, he said about Moshe Rabbeinu that he was synonymous with the Torah because, because he stated, he said, Zichru Torah Moshe Avdi. He didn't say remember the Torah. He said remember the Torah of Moshe. And Moshe, of course, is called Rabbeinu. He was a great prophet, but we don't call him Nivienu, our Navi, he was, in fact, the greatest of prophets. Maimonides says that even Mashiach, who will be great in so many ways, will not exceed the prophecy of Moses. So Moses, the greatest of prophets, is not called Moses the prophet or Moshe Hanavi. He's called Moshe Rabbeinu. He was a melech. He was a king, the Gemara says. And the word Hanavi applies to Samuel or Shmuel. The word Hamelech goes for David or Shlomo. Moshe Rabbeinu was a great scribe. He wrote the first 13 Sifr Torah, yet the word Hasofer applies to Ezra, not to Moshe. And I could go on, Zelda. He was a warrior. He was a redeemer. He's not called... Very humble. Yes, Moshe was humble, but Moshe Rabbeinu is not called Moshe Ha'anav either. There are people in history who are known as the humble people or the individual called the humble one. And Moshe Rabbeinu is called Rabbeinu. And Rabbeinu comes from the terminology of teacher because the greatest thing that Moshe Rabbeinu did. His essence, if you will, is encapsulated within the idea of teaching. So Moshe Rabbeinu represents teaching and, and Torah study. And Aaron, conversely, is called Aaron HaKohen. He was also a prophet. And he was a very great man. He was a tzaddik. And Mordechai is called a tzaddik, but Aaron's not called a tzaddik. He's called Aaron HaKohen. That's how he's known. As a Kohen means one who represented us in, in prayerful devotion before God, for that is the essence of the Mishkan and Migdash. And we know this because when the, we lost the Beit HaMikdash, our sages intuitively understood that only prayer could, in some pale reflective way, take the place of the Karbonot of the offerings. And that's Aaron's essence. Aaron's essence is prayer. And you know what, Zelda? Both of these are indispensable. A person cannot go through life spiritually in a healthy way if one does not pray on a regular basis. It's a mitzvah to pray every single day, according to Rambam. And one cannot go through life in a healthy way if he or she doesn't study Torah on a daily basis. And that's the way we should relate to and understand Moshe and Aaron in our own lives. We have to live lives that are emotionally charged from a Judaism perspective, and that comes from prayer. And we have to live lives that are wise and intuitive, lives, lives that are filled with understanding and vast Torah knowledge, because that's what Moshe Rabbeinu represents. And when we have Moshe and Aaron, we are able to realize the fulfillment of their dream and their mission, which was to bring the presence of God into our lives. The greatest thing Moshe and Aaron did is bring the Shechina, bring the, God's presence into our life. And when we dedicate our lives to God through prayer and Torah study, of course, both of which should lead us into action of making this world a holier, a godlier, a gentler, and a better place. We will, Be'ezrat Hashem, be successful in actualizing the Shechina of the Divine Presence with the coming of Mashiach speedily and in our days. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to mention our dear friend Lucy. Alright, I want to Lucy the hairdresser now. So.
All right, you will start the, start the film again. Where were we? Oh, about uh, being our Hana. Yeah. So, so the Rebbe adds this, this f- uh, phenomenal f- five words. He says that the taking of the, of the shank bone, the placing it on the Seder plate, making, like, like a, a, making an issue of the carbon Pesach, when we have no carbon Pesach, is the way we prepare for the future redemption. Because otherwise, we'll say carbon Pesach. Never heard of that. Hey, mom, you didn't tell me there's a carbon Pesach. We haven't been done this for like 2,000 years. People would have forgotten. So we didn't forget. And in this way, it's still vivid. It's still actualized, if not in, in an edible way, at least in some kind of tangible way. There's something on the Seder plate, and it's called shank bone, and it's called carb- Zechel of the carbon Pesach, and it reminds us that we will, Amir Tzashem, have a carbon Pesach again. So it's not something we do, not something we eat, but it's like a memory kind of thing. And the Rebbe says that this notion, this notion of a biblical requirement, a rabbinic requirement, and finally, beautiful memories, or being able to take things which are really beyond the purview of an instruction of the Torah, but use them to inspire us to come closer to Hashem, this represents the essence of of, of Pesach, the, pa- the Passover telling. And the Rebbe goes further and he says it represents not only the essence of the telling of the story, the recounting of the Exodus on the night of Pesach, but ultimately the Rebbe says that there's a teaching from his father-in-law, from the previous Rebbe, that in our Haggadah, in the Chabad Haggadah, we don't have the verse Chasal Sidr Pesach. The order of Pesach is concluded. Why not? You went through the whole Seder, now you can pat yourself in the back and say, we did all the things we were supposed to do. It's done. We don't say that. And the reason the Friedrich Rebbe explained is because Pesach never ends. Really, no Yom Tev ever ends. Every Yom Tev has lo- the lingering uh, in- impact on the whole year. It, ha- it, has a- it radiates energy and inspiration, but especially Pesach. Especially Pesach. Pesach is the foundation of our nation, of who we are as a people. So we- Pesach doesn't end. We don't say, ah, chasal si de Pesach. Now Passover is over, next. What's, what, what are we going to after this? No, we, we live with Pesach all year long. And the Rebbe maintains that if these are the three essences of the telling on the Seder night, then ultimately they become the essence of Yiddishkeit on the go forward all year long. So Rabbi Gamliel's Passover essentials could really be understood as Yiddishkeit essentials. So what's Yiddishkeit essentials? Pesach, Matzah, Mar. Okay. The Rebbe says Matzah, that which we're mandated to do, in our own personal lives. Let's, let's take it out of the, 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 the frame or language of the actual halacha, which this is something you're obligated to do biblically, this is something you're obligated to do rabbinically. Let's understand this more of on a proverbial sense. In Yiddishkeit, there are things we're obligated to do. What are we obligated to do? Whatever it says in the Shulchan Aruch. Whether it's of biblical origin or rabbinic origin, that's not important in our conversation now. In our conversation, there are things we're mandated to do. So why did you do that? Because I'm supposed to. Because the Shulchan Aruch tells me to. Because Jewish law ordains that I do, and I try to be a halachic Jew. I want to follow the mitzvahs, the customs, the, the ideas, the ideals that Judaism says I'm supposed to do. Okay, that's the idea of the matzah. It's obligatory. What is the essence of a rabbinic ordination, a rabbinic injunction? The essence, if, if, you, if you will, as, as um, our rabbis explained it to us, this is found in Mesechet Yevomot on page 21, but in many places, is the notion of asu mishmeret l'mishmarti. God said, you need to create guardrails. So, if there were no guardrails on the side of the highway, there would be many cars that would end up in the ravine and people would get hurt. The guardrails are there for a reason. There's banisters on the stairs because people would fall without the banister. We need these things. Well, you don't really, you don't walk down the stairs with your hands. Yeah, well, you kind of do. You walk down the stairs with your feet, but you have your guardrail. And anywhere there's a landing, there's always going to be some kind, of, some kind of fence. Well, who asked you to walk over there? Who asked you to jump? You can bet your bottom dollar that if there would be no railing around the stairway, somebody would fall down. It would just be a matter of time. People can't live walking tight ropes. Even tightrope walkers can't walk a tightrope all the time. That's an act they do for a certain amount of time. At some point, it just gets too difficult. 
So in everything in life, we all have buffer zones. We have areas where we know we're now going into a dangerous situation. You know, there's, there's wires, enormous amount of wires that go right, right, right past the, behind the property here. I've never gone down to the ravine, but I do, I do see when I drive by that there's a fence. And there's actually federal law that prohibits you from going within a certain space of the wire. What, do you think if you go into the area where the wires are, you get zapped? I can assure you no, nothing will happen to you. I can also assure you if children were playing stickball where the wires are, at some point, somebody would get hurt. Somebody's person, somebody's pet, somebody would get hurt. So therefore, it's a high voltage, you keep your distance. Okay, buffer zones. The spirit of a rabbinic injunction then in our own life is we can't assume that we are capable of walking a tightrope all the time. And we, we, we actually do this we do this intuitively, maybe not so much Yiddishkeit-wise, but we, everybody, Jew or Gentile alike, everybody has areas in life where they feel uncomfortable or they know they're going to be in a danger zone, so they avoid it. I'll give you three examples, and you tell me if I'm wrong. Are there people who, in whose presence you don't want to be? There is. Why? They trigger you, they make you uncomfortable, they bring out the worst in you. When, when, when you know there's people who are going to trigger you, you know, you could be on your, on, on your best behavior, you could be on guard. I could. And sometimes I have to be. It is what it is. If you have to go through the motions, you go through the motions. And you try very hard to behave yourself and rein yourself in and restrain yourself. But these are not the people you're going to socialize with. Why? I don't want to be uncomfortable. And it brings out the worst to me. So I'll do what I have to do, but I'll avoid these people. Not because if I'm going to be within earshot or eye shot, something's going to happen, but because something could happen. There are people who diet. Lots of people diet. It's one of the great challenges of our new era of prosperity. Once upon a time, people forage looking for food. Now people are trying to figure out how not to eat all the food that's available. And more people are dying from being overweight than from starvation for the first time since the world's creation. Never has there been such an amount of plenty. So a lot of people say, I don't, even, don't put that cake on the table. I don't even go near it. Once I start, wait, you can have a little piece. I, you know, I know what happens. A little piece doesn't stay with a little piece. I'm not, I don't want to go there even. Or it could be environments, atmospheres, places that are, that are not good for you. Not good for you. You, you. you know, when you go in a place like that, maybe it brings out laxity. It's a place, it's, you don't think it's healthy for you. So what do you do? You avoid a place like that. So whether we avoid objects or people or places, we all do things like this. We create our own buffer zones. Guess what? From a Yiddishkeit perspective, we actually are ordained to do the same thing. There's a special mitzvah called nedarim, called vows. On one hand, our sages say, what are you making vows for? 248 positive mitzvahs, is that enough for you? 365 issues to avoid, that's not sufficient. You needed a 366th? And, 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 and so the person says, well, you have to understand, I, I have a weakness. I have a weakness. Because I have a weakness, I need to create a buffer zone. So for example, and just a, a, you know, an extreme example that everybody can relate to, although Baruch Hashem doesn't affect anybody here, there are people who have issues with alcohol. Shalom Eda, it's a terrible thing. Alcoholism is a disease that kills. Horrible. Destroys marriages and families. It's a terrible disease. And if somebody is a a real alcoholic, and has to go get healed, do you know they can't have a little drink? Can't have a drink. Do you know the night of Pesach, they're halachically pro prohibited. They're not allowed to drink wine. This is the same halacha that tells us about one of the sages who had an aversion to wine and he would have stomach aches till Shavuot. And he only had one seder from drinking four cups of wine. But he drank four cups of wine because that's the mitzvah. And yet, if a person would come to me and say, Rabbi, I'm alcoholic. What should I do on the night of Pesach? I will advise him what to do, but I would not say to him, drink the wine anyway. Why? Because that's literally the life of death. Once the alcoholic tastes a little bit of alcohol again, that's over. Everything falls apart. Now this is unique to the alcoholic. The rest of us can not only drink four cups of wine on Pesach night, we can have a l'chaim even every day and nothing happens to us. The smoker, the drug addict. When you have an addiction to something in an unhealthy way, 
the smallest amount can trigger you. And then all the hard work just goes like that by the wayside. So when we talk about life, we all are familiar with barriers, guardrails, buffer zones that we create for ourselves. In Yiddishkeit, Hashem expects us to create extra, extra miles. Be more meticulous about things. You know your weakness better than anybody else. You know what you need to do, something extra. Whether it means reciting an extra chapter of Tom that you're not obligated to do, but something you want to do. You feel this will benefit you. Whether it means going an extra mile and doing a, a certain mitzvah a certain way. You, you, it doesn't say it in the Code of Jewish Law. But you know yourself that this is good for you and positive for you. And the last part of our Yiddishkeit journey is the notion of the Zechel Migdash, the carbon Pesach. This is not even something that's required. Like the buffer zone is actually is dangerous. If you don't have a buffer zone, you'll be in trouble. You need this. You need the buffer zone. But what's not ordained, you have to figure out what your buffer zone is, how to put up your own fence. But the carbon Pesach is representing an idea which is not necessary. What if there wouldn't be a carbon Pesach on the plate? Who would know the difference? Maybe nobody. But the Yiddishkeit wouldn't be the same. The Seder wouldn't be the same. When your Seder plate's missing an ingredient, as they say in Hebrew, Zelozer, something, something is missing tonight. And so it is also in our own Yiddishkeit that we have to be prepared to go, not only to worry about the things which we need to protect ourselves, but to look for the delight and the beauty of Yiddishkeit in reaching above and beyond the call. And that's the three-pronged approach of Judaism. And all unnecessary. If a person says, I'm only going to do what I have to do, I don't create any buffer zones, he will slip and trip. It's impossible always to walk the tight, tight rope. If a person says, I'll only do what I have to do if I'm threatened with a danger, but I don't, I don't really enjoy it, I don't emphasize or put an, a, an added flourish to my Yiddishkeit, to my Avedis Hashem, to my service to God, it's also going to be missing something. So Rabbi Gamliel's Passover essentials, as the Rebbe explained them, actually filter through and become Yiddishkeit essentials. So if somebody will say to you, you know, give me the quick, quick fix, what's Yiddishkeit? You can say to him, Pesach Matzamor. The obligatory, the, 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 fence, the fences, and finally, the delight, going the extra mile. And, and the way that Ebba interprets it, it means understanding that even everyday life can be spiritualized. Which means that things like exercising or grooming, things like holidays and vacations, things like casual conversations, everyday things can also have added meaning to it. Like a memory. Like you talked about something you did at the table. You didn't have to do it, it wasn't necessary. It just added something. So we can make ordinary things special when suddenly they remind us of something. A cookie is no longer a cookie when it's Bubby's cookie. The cup of wine is not just a cup of wine. Oh, that's what Papa did, and so on and so forth. So that's just a kind of pulling together what we learned last week, and, and um, I thought that was a, a nice way to begin today's class. We're still just at the beginning of the class. And before we go into the actual development of, of um, the details, there is one more, one more detail that I want to share with you. And that is, at a much later occasion, this was in the 56 or 57, the Sikha, and a much later occasion, the Rebbe authored a letter, a public letter, which as he would do, he would write these pastoral letters and send them to L'chol B'nei B'nei Sisal, to all the Jewish people, L'chol Makim Shem, wherever they be. And this letter was penned by the Rebbe or released on Yur Aleph Nisan, which was the Rebbe's birthday, in 1977. And the Rebbe here once again emphasized, he said that Pesach is all about nourishment. And since it's a mitzvah to tell our children, it's also ultimately an, an, a command that we have to provide for our children, to nourish our children. Not only give them physical food, but also give them spiritual nourishment. So what should the spiritual nourishment be? It should be in the image of Pesach Matzamur. What does that mean? So the gist of, of um, the way the Rebbe explained this at the time was that Pesach, or ma ma let's start off with matzah. Matzah represents that which is necessary for survival. We'll call that basic carbohydrates. Can't live without bread, so to speak. So that's just basic survival. As it says, lechem levav enashisod. Bread is a euphemism. It means the food basics that keep you alive whether you eat carbs or don't eat carbs. That's not the point. There's basic food. 
Not what I eat because I enjoy. Not what I eat because it's a little condiment. This is basic. Why are you eating? To stay alive. Food that keeps us alive. So every parent is responsible to provide food for their children. What does mora then represent? Mora represents bitter things, bitter herbs. The Rebbe says mora represents the need for parents not only to give their children something to chew on and to provide nourishment, but also to chastise when necessary. And in the modern era, parents are afraid to say anything these days. I mean, my kids will throw it back at me. So the truth is you have to proceed with caution. You have to know if criticism is just going to make them go more in, in the wrong direction, you have to find a smart way to criticize them. But nonetheless, even the best criticism is still criticism, and nobody really likes it. It's a bitter pill. So the smart people take medicine and get healthy. That doesn't mean they enjoy the medicine, they just take the medicine. The bitter pill is the need for us to be able to kind of guide our children in the right fashion, in the right way, and that's always less of an emphasis. Like it says, we have two hands God made for us. One hand is stronger, one hand is weaker. Most people, like myself, are right-handed, not left-handed. If you're left-handed, you're just in your right mind, and it just goes the other way. But the point is, one hand is weaker, one hand is stronger. God created such an exquisite body. Nobody could be calibrated. Everybody has to be off-kilter. So our sages tell us that's choreographed. God made us off-kilter. He said the stronger hand, that's the hand you embrace your child with. The weaker hand, that's the hand you discipline your child with. So you min mikareves, the right or proverbial stronger hand, you draw close. Smoil doicha, it's with the left or the weaker hand that you parry. So the, the experts will tell you that for every critical word you say to your children, you have to say 15 positive things to your children. And we know today modern science and, and psychology has come to understand and recognize and appreciate what Torah has been telling us ever since when? Positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is much more important. Create positive experiences of our children. That's what the Seder is about. It's positive. It's a happy night. We sing with the kids. We give them candies and prizes and whatever else we need to keep them awake. We create an excitement for them. It's so sad when people say, Rabbi, I can't keep the kids awake. Your kids, they want to stay awake. They're so excited to stay awake. You let them stay awake to watch the fireworks on July 1st. For heaven's sake, why would you let them stay awake? <laughs> Rabbi, that's different. That's special. Okay, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It's special. No, we have to get them to bed. Nebuch. That's, this is, this is the, the, the children love it. They're all of a sudden the center of attention. In every other faith system in antiquity, the children were supposed to be seen, not heard. At the Pesach Seder, the children must be heard. If a child's only seen, it's a, it's a shanda. He's got to ask the manashtana. So we engage the children. We make the children excited. The Rambam says, give them cloyes and egoism, give them nuts and candy. Make them, make them excited about this. Give them a positive experience doesn't mean that you can't say a negative word. Sometimes negative reinforcement is necessary. If you never discipline, you will not end up raising the proper child. Neshleim HaMelech says, If you withhold discipline, it does not mean the rod, literally. It means with discipline. If you withhold discipline, that means you detest your children, or you don't love them enough. The easy thing to do is just withhold discipline. Ah, I can't say anything bad. I can't deal with that. Deal with it. Do what's necessary. Raise your children, make a mention. So this is the idea of the mur. And finally, the last thing that Rebbe says is the concept of the Korban Pesach. Ah, the Korban Pesach you can only have when there's a Beis HaMikdash. Right? No Beis HaMikdash, no Korban Pesach. Listen how beautiful the Rebbe, the Rebbe describes this. He says, when was the Korban Pesach eaten? Do you know? On the Seder night, when was it eaten? It was eaten at the end of the meal. It's, it's called afikoman. Afikoman means dessert. And it's nechal, it's eaten al hasoiva. It has to be eaten after you're already full. You don't eat the carbon Pesach for dinner. You eat the carbon Pesach after dinner. Not stuff yourself. But I'm already sated. I've had dinner. Now this is a delicacy. Something extra. Like the Gemara says, there's always room for something sweet. Even if you're full, you can always have a little dessert. You have to leave a little room. You, you, you could end the meal here, but you're going to have a delicacy. And the delicacies, there's always room for. So the Rebbe says the following. If a Yid takes care of his or her children, and you give them a sense of nourishment that they need, you provide them with the bread. And what kind of bread are we talking about, the Rebbe says? So beautifully says, he says, the kind of bread we're talking about is, like it says, which this is 
a quote from the book of Proverbs, and I want to share it with you. It's so, so profound, so beautiful. What does Shlomo HaMelech say over here? He says, he says that God says to us, L'chu lachmu belachmi, which, which uh, as the Metsudas David says, it's a melitza, it's a metaphor. It's as if to say, this beautiful wisdom of Torah, come have some of my bread. God says, I'm sharing my bread with you. It's not, oh God, another Torah class? Would he end already? <laughs> It's Hashem's food. Hashem's sharing His food with you. You're invited to the king's table. The king said, have some of my food. I give you a portion. I got the delicacies. I'm giving you my food, my bread. So when you provide your children with Torah and they understand that this is a privilege, it's, they're getting to eat at the king's table. They're having some of Hashem's food. And the Rebbe goes on to say something phenomenal. He says that if you want to give the bread right, the sustenance right, it has to be matzah. Why matzah? What's the difference between chametz and matzah? I'll give you a little hint. They both incorporate flour and they both incorporate water. Chemically speaking, something, a grain, one of the five grains will contain either Amy B or Amy D Lacey, or Amy C or Amy B. This is a chemical. It's a chemical that when encountering alkaline or something alkaline based, like water, it will trigger a process called chimutz, fermentation. Bread, chametz, pasta, bagels, pretzels, flour, and water. Matzah, flour, and water. What's the difference? It doesn't rise. You didn't let it rise. It takes 18 minutes to rise. So yeah, we triggered the process of development and creativity, but made sure to impede it very quickly. It, it, it rose just enough. It came together to form dough, but we didn't let it get filled with little air pockets. What did the air pockets represent? Arrogance. Gaiva. So what do we have to do? Bake it before the gaiva gets out of control. So what does matzah represent? It is the ultimate humble bread. The real humble bread is matzah. You need to give your children food, but remind them the kind of food they should eat is humble bread food. Meaning that as they become wise in Torah, they shouldn't be arrogant, chas v'shalom, from the Torah they learn. The Torah they learn should teach them humility. The more they know, the more humble they should be. And there's a, there's a beautiful sicha where the Rebbe speaks about how Yosef at Tzaddik was able to gather grain. Everybody's grain rotted, but Yosef's didn't rot. Do you remember? It's a story in Parshas Mikitz. How come, Rashi says, how come Yosef's grain didn't rot? It didn't rot, the Torah tells us, because Yosef put a little bit of soil with the grain. And the soil that Rebbe suggests represents the idea of humility. Like we say in a davening, my soul should always be humble. So Yosef made sure the food wouldn't spoil or rot by placing soil, by placing, proverbially speaking, humility. So that's why the Torah is telling us you should, need, you should give sustenance, give nourishment, provide your children with, with bread. What kind of bread? Matzah. Humble bread that along with the knowledge, along with the development, has to come a profound sense of humility. And then, you have to criticize sometimes. You have to rebuke. You have to rein him in. You have to give the murder to. And the Rebbe says this. If you will give your children matzah and murder, more matzah than murder, you'll give your children more positivity, but also some negativity, the right and the left, and they'll get it in a humble way, guess what they'll succeed in doing? they'll succeed in building themselves into a little Beis HaMikdash. Because that's what a Beis HaMikdash is. V'shachanti b'tocham. I will dwell amongst them, the famous teaching of our rabbis, b'toch kol echad ve'echad, within each and every one. So if you give matzah and moror, then the child builds a Beis HaMikdash. And if you get to have a Beis HaMikdash, what do you bring in a Beis HaMikdash? A korban. And what's the korban you bring? The korban Pesach. Ah, the Rebbe says, this is the climax of bringing, what is the carbon Pesach? It's not what's necessary. It's not for survival. It's delight. It's a delicacy. Because, because my dear friends, you know what Yiddishkeit done right looks like? It's a Yiddishkeit that's enjoyed. So your children not only do what's right, they love what's right. They delight in the Yiddishkeit. They have a tainug. They're not doing it because they feel they have to do it. They're doing it because they want to do it. I'm not going to raise my children right because I want Jewish survival. 
I don't want to make sure there's a Jewish tomorrow. I'm going to raise my children right because I delight in Yiddishkeit. Because I want Yiddishkeit to flourish. And that's what the carbon Pesach represents. So this is a much later teaching from the Rebbe, almost, almost 30 years later. But nonetheless, very, very, again, very beautiful idea which explains how these are not only holiday essentials, but ultimately Yiddishkeit essentials. That's what we take from Pesach. goes into the whole year. Okay, so this is just a little preface to today's class. And ultimately, we, we talked about these three ideas in a previous class. And, and the next thing we, we we're going to talk about now is we're going to go into the details. So we said Pesach, Matzah, Mor. So let's talk a little about the Pesach. Pesach says the Haggadah, Shehoyu aveseinu oichlim bizman shebet hamikdash kayim. The Pesach, which our ancestors would eat at the time when the Beis Hamikdash was standing. Al Shoma. Why, why are we doing this? In other words, what is its intrinsic message? What is the Pesach about? And the answer, Al Shum, this is by the virtue of, or because of, Sheposach HaMokim Abate Avesenu B'Mitzrayim. Because God leaped over the houses or skipped over the houses of our ancestors in Egypt. There's a lot to say about these two sentences. I'm going to take it from the top. The first thing you see here now, it says, Pesach, Shahayu Aveseinu Oichlim Bizman Sebeis Hamigdash Kayim. The Pesach that was eaten at the time when the Beis Hamigdash was standing. What does that tell us about this Rabbi Gamliel? If he's talking about the Pesach that was eaten at the time when the Beis Hamigdash was, past tense, was standing. Bizman Shabbat Shalom English, Haya Kayam, when it was. What does this tell us about Rabbi Gamliel? He had to be after. He had to be after. So actually, there's a, one of the great Rishonim, his name is Rashbats, Rabbi Shimu ben Tzemach Duran, and he says Rashbats, aha, you see, this is not talking about the famous Rabbi Gamliel, known as the, the first Rabbi Gamliel. This instead is talking about the second Rabbi Gamliel, because there was a Rabbi Gamliel who he lived in the time of the Beis HaMikdash. And in his, his days, the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. So there was Shimon, who was the son of Hillel, and there was Gamliel. And that Gamliel, he saw a Beis HaMikdash. And he gave his teaching when there was a Beis HaMikdash. So this must be a different Rabbi Gamliel. This is his grandson. This is who man is known as Rabbi Gamliel the Yavne. Rabbi Gamliel who was in Yavne, which is a later period, this is the Rabbi Gamliel who did not live in the time of the Beis HaMikdash. Okay. The Chido, in his commentary on the Haggadah, Simchas HaRegel, says, um, I'm not so sure how the Rashbats came to that conclusion. Because, he says, if you go back to the Mishnah, and if you remember, last, in the last class we talked about the Mishnah, this is based on a Mishnah, in the 10th chapter of Mesechet Pesachim, the Mishnah says, Ve'elohein Pesach Matzah Umar. Pesach al shum shapasach hamakam abate avesenu b'mitzrayim. It doesn't say, it doesn't say anything about shahayu oichlem b'zman sabeis hamigdash kayam. And so the chida reasons in Simchas Haregel that actually, and the Rebbe brings this down in his Haggadah, and he says, kol ze eini b'mishnah. This whole sentence is not found in the Mishnah. The Mishnah doesn't say shahayu oichlem avesenu oichlem b'zman sabeis hamigdash kayam. The Mishnah just says, Pesach al Shum Ma. So, because it doesn't say, in the Mishnah, so we don't have to say that this Rabbi Gamliel lived after the Beis HaMikdash. What could we say instead? When did this Rabbi Gamliel live? Whenever he lived, the time of the Beis HaMikdash. So, who put these words in? These words were Haisafas Mesadar Haggadah. Whoever it is, the anonymous sage who arranged the Haggadah in the post temple era. The Haggadah, as we have it, he added those words in. Because, after all, we didn't have a Pesach. The Baal Haggadah was formulating a Haggadah for people like us who didn't have a Pesach English. And this is a very strong question that the Chida in Simcha Saragal asks on the Rashbats. And he basically says he disagrees with the Rashbats. And he says, no, this is the original Rabbi Gamliel. This is Rabbi Gamliel living in the time of the Beis HaMikdash. It's not Rabbi Gamliel of Yavna. And these words were added in by the Baal HaGadah. So it's based on the Mishnah, but it is not verbatim from the Mishnah. Now, another interesting thing is that we go on now. And we say, Shanemar, because it's written, V'yamartem zevach pesachu Hashem. And you will say it is a zevach pesach. 
It is a slaughtering, a korban of Pesach. For God, Asher Pesach al Bati b'nei Yisrael b'Mitzrayim, who sprung over the houses of the Jewish people, b'Nog Feis Mitzrayim, when he struck Egypt, v'ez Bateinu Hitzel, and our houses were saved, v'yikei da'om v'yishtachavum. So it was very interesting that in the actual Mishnah, and most versions of the Mishnah, and the Mishnah it definitely isn't, in the early versions of the Gemara, this whole business doesn't show up either. This is added in later on. This seems to be added. So the Rebbe doesn't say it's not, it's not a Bala Agada. Some maintain this is what the Marsha said, this is what has to be. But this Pasuk gets added in at a later point, and it's very much Haggadah related as we have the Haggadah today. So I want to now talk about the Pesach for a few moments. Because Pesach al Shumah, why, why are we doing the Pesach? So first thing you should know is al Shumah, Zechel and Migdash. That's the Bala Agada makes very clear to you. Why do we do this? This is a zecher, a memory of what used to happen in the time of the Beis HaMikdash. Okay, very nice. So let's go to the Mishnah then. Mishnah al Shum, because because God jumped over our houses. All right, what's the message? What, is, what, is, what does that mean? Saved. He saved us. Okay, so Pesach is about just saving us. So why say Hitzil? It should be Korban Hatzola. Korban of saving. Why Korban of Pesach? In other words, the jumping was not the saving. The jumping was a detail. Why focus on the detail and miss out on the purpose? You could say, somebody saved my life. I was in a terrible situation and somebody saved my life. You know how he saved my life? Because this guy was pointing a gun at me and the guy knew Kung Fu and he kicked the gun out of the hand. And I'll never forget that he kicked the gun out of the guy's hand. I would say, I'll never forget that he saved me. How he saved me is of lesser importance than he saved me. Whether he kicked the gun out of the hand or he sneezed it out of his hand, I don't care how he did it. He saved me. The important thing is I was saved. Why is it so important for us to emphasize the notion that God jumped over the houses, which becomes the name of the Korban, as I'll soon show you. Rashi says that clearly in the Chumash. And furthermore, it becomes the name of the whole holiday even. But we're talking about the Korban now. And it says, the Pesach al Shumma. why do we have a Korban? Al Shum she Pesach. Is, is that why? What if he wouldn't have jumped over our houses? It just would have saved us. W- wouldn't be good? Then we wouldn't have this whole conversation? So, Clearly, there's something missing here. So so what I want to suggest to you is in order to understand and appreciate what we're about to say, since it's a Pasuk, we need to go back to the Pasuk. Especially because later it says, the Amartem, in the Pasuk we quote, which comes from a much later place, we say, in that Pasuk, we say, the Amartem Zevach Pesach. You'll tell the child that it's a Zevach Pesach. So we see, not only it's called Pesach, but it's our responsibility as parents to tell the children, and to tell each other. You know why it's a Korban Pesach? Because... Because Pasach al because he jumped over the homes. So really, it would make sense to be a good idea for us to go back to the actual verse. And we'll take a look at Pshuto Shal Mikra. Even the most simple, straightforward interpretation. And my friends, you're in for a little surprise. It doesn't just mean skipping. Exodus, chapter 12, verse 13. It didn't happen yet, but Moses is describing what will happen. He says, God said, I am going to do justice to all of the gods of Egypt. God is speaking. He says, the blood will be for you. Laois has a sign, I'll have bottom on the homes. Asher atem sham, that you are there. And Hashem says in the Torah, Viraiti et adam, I will see the blood. Ufasachti alehem, and I will spring over them. I will pasachti over them. What does this mean? I will pasachti over them. So let me introduce you to Rashi, my friends. Rashi says, you know what the meaning of of pasachti is? He says it means v'chamalti. Chemla in Hebrew means mercy. We're showing pity and compassion. So ufasachti, Rashi says, actually means I will show compassion. God showed mercy for us. He didn't just jump over us. He showed mercy for us. And Rashi says, let me give you a cross-reference. The cross-reference is God speaking to and about the Jewish people many, many years later through the prophet Isaiah. And there he uses similar verbiage. He says, Pasoyach v'himlet. I will, Pasoyach, which sounds like skip, and I will save. I'll kind of snatch them out of a negative situation. Let's take a look at the Pasuk. See what this is talking about. So Isaiah here is speaking 
and he speaks about Hashem doing justice to the enemies of the Jewish people. However, he will shield and protect us. Isaiah 31, it's in verse 5. The verse starts off with the imagery of birds, like a bird escaping, flying away. Kitsiparim afois, like birds who fly away and escape. You know how birds sometimes, the snare, like it says, we escaped. The bird flies away. This says, Yeshayo Hanavi says, Isaiah is how God will shield the holy city of Jerusalem. Gonoin vihitzil. The word gonoin means the concept of to shield, to protect. Like lahogin. Yogin. Yogin comes to the word mogin. Mogin is the noun. Mogin is a shield. Like mogin Avram, mogin David. Mogin is a shield. Yogin is a verb. He will shield. The Hitzil, the word Hitzil, you know what that word is. Hatzola, save, right? Hatzil. Pasoyach vehimlet. God will shield and he will save. He will pasoyach vehimlet. So what does it mean, pasoyach? So Rashi says, very interestingly, dilug. He said it means jumping. He says, v'yesh oid but that's not enough. I can't leave you with just that. There's another way of understanding as l'shen chayis, with a samach. L'shen chayis, means to have compassion, to have mercy for. And the Mitzudah Sian says, Pasayach is dilug, but he says in the Mitzudah's David, it's not only about the idea of jumping, but he says, actually Mitzudah's David doesn't say it, Rashi says it, Lashon Chayas. So his David speaks only about jumping. He says it also means the idea of mercy. This is very, very important, my friends. A very important concept in Korban Pesach. It's not only about jumping, it's about mercy. God having mercy. What's the difference between kindness and mercy? People use them together. They say, Chesed Velachamen. It's even a terminology used in Torah literature. Chesed, what's the difference? If you're kind, why do you have to be merciful? If you're merciful, what does kindness add? So simply stated, kindness is the urge to be kind, to be nice. What if that person doesn't deserve your being nice? No, but he's a nice person. So nice people are as a rule nice to everybody because they're nice. A chasdon means a person who is punctuated, characterized by chesed. What do people like that do? They do chesed. To who? To everybody. They do chesed. That's, that's what they do. So the chesed person does chesed. Why? What do you mean why? Because that's who they are. So what's rachmem? What's mercy then? Think about it. Somebody says, would you please have rachmanus on me? When you're asking somebody to have rachmanus on you, if they wouldn't have rachmanus, if they wouldn't have compassion, would you give it anyway? They say, please, help me. So the chesed man says, or woman says, of course. Why not? So then the person comes back a second time. Could you help me? Sure. Why not? What if it's the fifth time? Sixth time? What if it's the 20th time? At a certain point, you start get a little frustrated. You know, like, I think I helped you six times already. You think maybe you should start helping yourself? And the person says, have achmanus. Have achmanus. That means this is a person who's actually responsible for their own challenges and difficulties. I'm not just called upon to be nice, I'm called upon to be chesed. No, not just nice, but even when I'm not interested in being nice anymore, that's when the mercy and the compassion kicks in. In other words, where chesed ends, mercy begins. Chesed is blind to faults. Chesed does not see the virtues of the person, whether they are deserving or not. Chesed ignores whether... It's chesed. Chesed does chesed. Gvura, which is the polar opposite of chesed, is restraint, discipline. Discipline says you get what you deserve. You sing for your supper. Or you don't get supper. So the person comes along and he says, can you give me supper? So if the person is not a gvura, din person, judgment, the person is chesed, he says, sure. But I didn't sing. Yeah, no, I don't care. I'm just happy to give. But the person with the, with the disciplinarian says, I'm just going to give you. And truth be told, the giving is not really good always. If you always give, 
and you never discipline, you spoil the child. So who gets to give without any kind of limitation? Who gets to give without limitation? Grandparents. <laughs> Grandparents, it's not their job to discipline. Gra the grandparents' job is to spoil the kids. Whose job is the discipline? The parents. The par if the parents don't discipline, they have shirked their responsibility. So your grandparents don't raise you. Your grandparents, if you're fortunate to have them, add added beauty to life. It's beautiful to have grandparents. It's so nice to have grandparents. Why? Because, because they're adding something which your parents couldn't give. But your parents' job is to raise the kids. And that's the truth. If, parents, if grandparents have to raise the children, we have a problem. Then the parents are AWOL. So you don't have to come to a bubby and say, Bubby, have Rachmanus, give me some candy. The bubby's happy to give the candy. But the kid says, Ma, give me the candy. And Ma says, no, you didn't finish your supper. I don't know about you, but I have memories of sitting at that supper table for many hours because that was a big auction. And it's, nope, no, nope, nope, you're not getting the dessert. <laughs> I remember when you pour him. They, there was, we were living in New Jersey then. The yeshiva students, my father used to learn where they brought that whole big thing of candy and I wanted the candy. My mother said, you have to finish your plate. And that was a big auction. I didn't finish my plate and I didn't get the candy. But then grandparents, ah, the grandparents give. You know, they, you don't have to ask them for rachmonis, right? <laughs> so where does rachamim begin? Where chesed ends. We, the Jewish people, sometimes get judged, you know? You know, God doesn't just give us indiscriminately. In fact, oftentimes, we're expected to earn our keep. And the blessings that Yaakov got, he was told that he would get the blessings if he deserved them. Esau, Esau gets blessings. Esau gets, he's living on the land. But Yaakov, not so. The Jewish way is, it's all commensurate. We reach out to Hashem, Hashem reaches out to us. But the good news is that sometimes the Ebeshter has Rahmanus on us. This is a key and foundational part of our relationship with God. In fact, it's so important that it's the focus of the Korban Pesach itself. Ultimately, the Ebesh has Rachmanus on us. So the person messed up and did everything wrong, and we didn't do Hashem's mitzvahs right, and we didn't learn His Torah right, and yet, He still loves us anyway. Why? Because He has Rachmanus. Avinu of Harachaman. That's Korban Pesach, my friends. That's the Korban Pesach. So therefore we say, And Rashi, interestingly, in Yeshayahu Anavi, he says, Dilug, first jumping, and then he says, you also have to add the compassion. But in Rashi's commentary on the Chumash and Parshas Boy, he says, no, 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 the first thing he says is, V'chomalti, Hashem has compassion. Like he told Yeshayahu Anavi, he would protect us. Rashi says, V'ani oimer, and Rashi's not arguing. Because when he argues on a first interpretation, he'll say, I don't agree with this. He doesn't say, I don't agree with this. This is the way of Moshe Hadarshan, which is a, a senior teacher who Rashi greatly respected. This is the way he, he, he explained it. Uh, sorry, Rabbi Menachem in the Machberes puts it. Rashi just adds. Rashi says, Kol pesicha loshem diluk. Every time you have pesicha, there's going to be a jumping element to it. And he says, therefore, upasachti. He's not taking away from the first interpretation. He's adding to it. Incidentally, Unculus, who's Rashi's rock, he translates it as such. He says, Ve'echos aleichem. Echos means, I will have mercy, of compassion for you. Rashi says, it always has an element of skipping and jumping to. Medaleg mibati yisar lebati mitzayim. Hashem skipped from Jewish homes to the Egyptian homes. Shah yashru yim zeh because they were living amongst each other. And he says, V'chein, where do I, how will I prove this to you? He says, Peseach al shtei asi'ifim. And this is a pasuk which is found in the book of Kings. The very famous prophet, his name was Elijah. And he saw the people. And what were they doing? They were going to Shul on Shabbos and going somewhere else on Sunday or on Friday. They were, as the world says, dancing at two weddings. But it's not what it really means. Peseach al shtei asi'ifim, Rashi says, means shtei machshavas. They have uh, dual loyalties. Loyalty to God and loyalty to other deities. That's not okay. You can't say, I'm loyal to my spouse. I'm also loyal to somebody else's spouse. That's no good. You, uh, ma marriage is, is, is single, singular. If it, loyal has to be absolute loyalty. So therefore, the loyalty in marriage, which we have at Hashem, it's loyal. The Yohan says it doesn't work like this. God's not your buddy. 
You can't be married to God on Shabbos and married to another God on Sunday. It doesn't work like that. The relationship has to be singular. And that's what marriage requires, that kind of singular commitment. So he says, different thoughts. And Eliyahu and Avi said, that's the worst of all. You want to abandon God? So abandon him. Now, of course, Eliyahu and Avi's gambling. What would they, what would, what would they abandon would, would abandon God? But Eliyahu and Avi believed in the Jewish people. He knew that if their choice would be put to them, and they'd have to either embrace God or abandon him, he knew they would embrace God. So Eliyahu and Avi was, was ready to put his... Here you go. He threw down the gauntlet. But what does it actually mean? The Mitzvah David says, he says, it means lush and mushal. It's a borrowed language. And it comes from seif ilon, from different twigs on a tree, different branches on a tree. And he says, that's how thoughts are. Sometimes in our thoughts, we, go, we branch this way, branch that way. Thoughts go like that. Thoughts branch out in different directions. And the bird sometimes hops from branch to branch. And that's fine for a bird to hop from branch to branch, but even the bird eventually makes itself a nest and stays in one place. So that's the idea of it always indicates this hopping, skipping, skipping around. And Rashi says, therefore, you have to know that whenever we use the word pasachti, it's going to have an element of skipping. In other words, if pasachti means vechem, that, that was chamalti, so why doesn't he say chamalti? If it means chamalti, say chamalti. So Rashi says, because it means also skipping. And he says, kol ha A Paiseach is a person who limps. A person who can't walk in a normative fashion. Whether one leg is longer or shorter. Whether a person is impaired. The knee doesn't work. So how do people like that experience mobility? They hop, they hobble, they jump. They're not able to take steady step after step. But rather they have to propel themselves forward. And he says, this is what we're talking about over here. This is what it means. And it's interesting, later on, when the story actually unfolds, in chapter 12, in, in uh, verse 23, it says, God came to strike Egypt. And Rashi again says, The first thing he says is, God had compassion. Because this was the night of judgment. And judgment, or justice, is blind. If it's judgment, it's judgment. We did many sins too. If Hashem was punishing idolaters, guess who should have been included? Yeah, our ancestors. But Hashem didn't. And this is internal recurring message for the Jewish people. Even when we fall short, Hashem will have Rahmanus on His people. And even when we drop the ball, Hashem picks it up for us. The Yesh Lamer Vidilig. Rashi adds in here the second time, he barely even mentions it. You could also say Vidilig. So in Pshut HaShal Mikra, when we read this Pasach HaShum Pasach, what are we speaking about? First and foremost, the concept of the skipping and the jumping. And that's the message of the Korban Pesach. The message of Korban Pesach is Hashem's compassion for us. The first thing Ayid has to know is Ayid's never alone. That the Eibish, the Almighty God, has compassion for us. That even if we don't deserve it, Hashem will give us His blessings anyway. That's not saying we shouldn't earn it. But if we only appeal to Hashem's Rachman, if we only return to Hashem, Hashem will have Rachmanus. And we will never only be judged by our actions. Hashem will judge us, look at us differently because, because we're His children. So your teacher may not have Rachmanus on you. The border guard certainly is not going to have Rachmanus on you. But your parents will. It's different because it's still a parent. And even when a parent disciplines, the parent disciplines in a way which is tempered by mercy, by Rachmanus. That's the first thing we want to, to tell our children as we speak about the Korban Pesach, the Seder night, we told the narrative, the narrative has to be with an emphasis that Hashem always has Rachmanus on His children. And there's more, but we're really out of time. So we're going to stop here, and with Hashem's help, we will continue Bezat Hashem next week. Why does it say Rabban? Good question. The reason it says Rabban is because the family of Hillel was, they traced their lineage back to David HaMelech. And because they traced the lineage to David HaMelech, they were ultimately seen as kind of a, an incarnation of Davidic royalty, even though there was no actual king. They weren't political kings, but they were revered by the Torah community. As it says, Man Malki, who are our kings today? Because we had no king. We had, and the Hashemunayim came, we were finally independent, and they still didn't establish a kingdom. So the Jewish people this time gave up. They said, we're not going to have a king until Mashiach comes. So he said, okay, it won't be a Jewish king, the way the Torah says it. Who, who will be our king then? Man Malki. 
And the answer was Rabbanon. So Rabban Gamliel was the Nasi, the president of Sanhedrin, and he was looked at in a way not only as Rebbe, but Nasi. So Rabban is a conjunction of Rebbe and Nasi. That's why it's Rabban. Only the family of Hillel had this title, except of Yochanan and Zakkai, who stepped in briefly to the position when Shimon ben Hillel wasn't strong enough to do it. Oh. I just noticed that. I never saw that before. Have a beautiful day, everybody. I'm sorry you went over, uh, went so long. I apologize. <laughs>